Hi everyone and welcome to London Tech Leaders Series 3. For those who haven't joined us previously, uh, essentially London Tech Leaders is a, is a growing platform for heads of transformation, transformation leaders, CXO kind of level, board level discussions. Um, and it's an opportunity to discuss the latest industry trends in the market, challenge conventional thinking. Um, but when we go back to kind of in-person events, it's a real opportunity to network with your peers, um, where you might not get to do so on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, let's crack on. So, uh, we've got a few questions as advertised. Um, at the moment, there has been, it's been reported that there's been a 41% increase in cyber crime um, during, uh, during the pandemic period. Um, I mean, cyber security is a, is a big issue. It seems to be evolving daily. Um, uh, to, today, I've, I've had to deal with some, some cybercrime in, in uh, my organization. It, I know that my colleagues will have elsewhere as well. It's, it's happening all the time. So, you know, what, what can we do about that? What, what, what level of investment do we need to make here? How important is it? You know, what sort of things can we do, can we do to tackle the increase in, in uh, data breaches and, and general cybersecurity problems? Jacob, do you want to tackle that one for us first? Yes, I mean, that's a, it's a very interesting challenge, cyber security, uh, because it is constantly moving, it's getting very sophisticated, it's getting harder, and therefore it needs to be carefully um, managed and proactively managed. Um, I came across an interesting quote, I mean, this is a very extreme view, but this quote from a, a, an American computer scientist, Gene Spafford, who once said, the only truly secure system is one that is paired off cast in a block of concrete and sealed in a lead-blind room with armed guards. And even then, I have doubts. So uh, this is an extreme view, but it just sets the scene, I think, in, in my view. Um, look, most organizations recognize the importance uh, and the threat of cybersecurity, um, and especially in regulated environments. Um, many organizations have been through the process of assessing their maturity, that normally leads to an understanding of the weaknesses uh, um, that they've got and then uh, building uh, some sort of a cyber security remediation program to address those weaknesses and increase the maturity around prevention, detection and response. And many organizations go through cyber security incident um, uh, drills and what have you. And, and the, um, the, the approach is getting more uh, advanced. People are looking at threat-led testing, you know, CBEST is the best kind of known uh, framework for that. Uh, but in, in general, when you look at the maturity within certainly financial services based on the most recent FCA PRA kind of, uh, survey done on this, uh, you wouldn't be surprised that uh, a number of organizations are still uh, in the kind of low to medium maturity um, uh, score. Um, this is why organizations are um, um, spending more money in their budgets, allocating more money in their budgets for cyber security programs in order to address that. But it's interesting you mentioned COVID. So when you look at COVID, you lay that on top, it adds another layer of complexity because there's a significant increase in, in cyber attacks as, as a result of COVID. Some of them ha have been opportunistic because um, many companies have had to send people home to work from home and that's been done rapidly, stood up remote working uh, practices and some uh, hackers are taking advantage of that. Um, see, the reduced consumer spending is causing these hackers to look at other ways of um, revenue, if you like, for themselves, um, as well as organized crime, looking at companies in desperate uh, situations. Um, so. And of course, the other thing which is really important is many organizations are focusing more and more on their digital channels. Hence, if, if not done right, it, they, they may have vulnerabilities which would, uh, would uh, impact their cyber security posture. So, a very interesting topic. Um, um, it needs a lot of focus. It's an inherent risk, so it needs to be managed continuously. I don't think there's a, uh, an end to this. This is an ongoing process that organizations need to be uh, to, to be uh, investing in okay that's really great you mentioned uh, you know it can be a heavily regulated world yeah D des that's a that's a world that you know very well um, you know lots of regulations in your industry that you're in and, and have been 
How, how does how does cybersecurity, you know, is, is there a difference for you? I noticed you nodding when Jacob was like, it's a continuous thing. So how, how, do, how do you approach that? What's your experience there? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I agree with a lot of what, um, you know, uh, Jacob has, has sort of um, articulated there. I think, you know, I always look at cybersecurity as it's, it's like walking up or down escalator that just keeps getting faster. So, you know, whatever you did last the last year isn't going to be enough to do this year. And, and I think the challenge is that as, uh, you know, as we start to move more of our business workflows and businesses, you know, and, and COVID's escalated this quite quite quickly. You know, everybody's now working from home and I think, you know, uh, yeah, uh, Jacob t t talked into that, but also businesses are changing their, their, their business models. But, you know, we're seeing much more, um, a, a, a huge increase in internet um, financial traffic, going into people's homes, um, you know, the security that's required around, uh, you know, from, from a business perspective on those workflows that you, did, you, you weren't even using previously or they were side, side channels for you, whereas now they're primary channels. I think from a regulatory point of view, um, you know, the, the regulators continue to um, adapt and adopt as we go. You know, the, the, the analogy of the, the downward escalator, you know, walking up the downward escalator applies um, to, to, to regulators as well, that they're continually looking and reassessing uh, the position of, of organisations. We, we work very closely with um, you know, for the financial, um, the you know, PRA um, uh, you know, and, and, and other regulators around helping adapt, helping them understand what we're doing to help adapt some, some of the, you know, the white papers or, or, or views that they're, they're taking on things. I think, you know, for me now, though, it is BAU, um, you know, and, and that is, is sort of weird in the sense that, you know, um, something so impactful can needs to be part of the organization. And I think where historically we've gone through cycles of investment in security, you know, it always used to be there'd be a security event and everybody, everybody would pile in investment into security and then it would dip down again after a couple of years because everybody would sort of forget about it. Now I think it's a continual grind. Um, and I think the, the switch between um, you know, cyber transformation programs or cyber programs and your and your run organization and actually embedding that into your run organization where they're continually doing the things you used to do through projects is one of the key switches i think that we're making certainly a lot of organizations are starting to make that starts to land differently because where you invest you know for many organizations your investment budget and your opex budget are seen as very different and starting to talk about switching you know capital spend and investment spend into more of an operating cost spend is one that uh, you know a number of organizations are struggling with because you start to see those numbers and what you've got to do to protect the organization um, and you've got to balance those out with other operational risks that the organization's got and i think that's the other thing i'd add is you know security needs to be at the risk table it's not an it thing um, it's a business risk thing and it needs to be alongside all of the other risks around you know whether that's operational whether it's financial whether it's regulatory it needs to be on that on that table and in that conversation because actually it sits across all of those. There's a lot of nodding around the room as as you said that. I think as as technology professionals, we spend a lot of our life trying to get, you know, some alignment and some shared ownership on many issues with our our, uh, our wider business colleagues. I think that's a that's a really important one. But so far, I think Jacob and Des have, have given a a good solid view of of you know the CIO CTO kind of view of the world we 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 need it to be secure it's a continuous improvement thing but Neve but what about the users right we've got lots and lots of, of of customers or internal users or whatever right they just want to use this stuff yeah what what about the impact to them of an ever tightening ring of well to use uh, Jacob's point a concrete box you know how how do we um how do we deal with that yeah, it is a really, a really interesting it's the dynamic. I mean, there's a friction, isn't there? Because we're putting in lots of security measures and they're needed for all the good reasons that we've talked about, regulatory reasons as well. 
but it does cause friction depending on how these things are getting put in um, and certainly I see that you know from a from a user base perspective um, some of the things around you know uh, you know stripping out uh, links and you know filtering out things then they get immensely frustrated because they feel like they can't do the job properly and so I think as a CIO you've always got to sort of try and balance that a, a little because if you make it too hard for people to do the job then they just find workarounds they find other hacks or other ways to you know work around the system so uh, you know for me it's always about this frictionless IT and how can we get security so that it's almost invisible to the end users it's kind of there but they're not having to try and engage with it or it's not becoming an irritation to them some of that is about a communication and as we've talked about uh, Des talked about the education and the business owning it as well and some of it I think is about just getting smarter with some of the technology we've put in okay that's great I think the um uh, one of the things about that is we were talking about engagement with with the wider businesses, and I think you know nowadays, particularly in the uh, in the e-commerce worlds or the or, or, or the worlds where we have, you know, where we're trying to get people to transact with us or engage with us, we're, we're worried about attrition, we're worried about conversion, we're worried about all of those things, and you know, you're saying we've got to we've got to navigate some of those, Neve, and I think that's true. Um, the point that Des made about being engaged, Phil, we've got a question from David Linwood. He's saying. Does the panel think that the business units understand their role in cyber security properly, especially in working out strategies should a cyber event occur? So what do you what do you think about that? Do, do, do we have to drag these, the, you know, our business counterparts along or, or, or are they getting it more, do you think? Uh, my experience is they're getting it more now. I think it's not a case of, of dragging and maybe it used to be. Maybe it's different for different organisations, but I think with increasing audit regulation compliance uh, and just that the the weight of headlines um whether you say that's talk talk or others um you know it, it's in the public domain now these things happen and and you know protecting the brand that you work in from those from those threats protecting the teams that you work with from those threats looking after the individuals i mean everybody now is increasingly busy working in different places they can't turn to a colleague and say you know have you seen this what do you think it's it's more important that we have cyber security awareness we have online tools we continue to 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 press the messages that the, the threats are increasing um you know uh, current as i understand it roughly industry average which we're experiencing as well is about 80 percent of all inbound email is being blocked for you know content that's not relevant to the business and 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 i think that's probably a, a relatively standard a relatively standard context but for busy people the one that gets through is the one they click on and i think it's just that continual evolution of awareness okay that's great i think we're going to finish on this question and move on to some other questions but i'm just going to finish with a comment from uh, one of our audience chris from red hat uk he says and i think our panel will agree with this security of every is everybody's responsibility within the organization people find workarounds because they don't have ownership of the problem we all need to take ownership and responsibility. The days of the security check at the end of the software development life cycle is severely dated. So I, 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 I think that's really good. De Des, you just had one little thing you wanted to add on the end of that, I think. Yeah, and, and, it's, and it's off the back of that, really. Um, y y yes, security is everybody's uh, responsibility. But I think we also have a responsibility, um, and I think Neve highlighted it, is, is to make it invisible to them. Um, because people are people. In the same way as you know there are little aspects to everybody's job the more that we can make security invisible but easy for people um the, the better and I, a great example is is face recognition on the iphone or, or on any phone um it's a double win right so so it's more secure right th than a password and it's easier for the user right now you know with, with masks on enough that i'm probably not the only person who's found that a real <laughs> a real pain but it's funny how quickly we've got used to that so i get you know if, if i'm looking to go pay for a coffee um obviously it costs us um i would uh, you know I, you suddenly you can't do that but that's a great example of where the technology and the usability and the customer journey has come together to say actually it's more secure but it's actually better for the customer and i think as technologists we'd have to look for for roots for that we have to look at ways that actually you know 
aid the aid our customer aid our users in their job but also make them more secure as well it is something everybody's responsible for but but we can't expect them to be thinking about that all the time we need to try and make it as easy for them to do that as possible but, but the, the the bottom line is technology is a lot easier to change than culture it's a lot easier to change a firewall rule than it is to stop a user community from sticking passwords on post-it notes on screens. And it, it's fundamental that, that we have to work cohesively with technology and culture to shift it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think it is, it is about technology, it's about process, it's about people, all three of them. Yeah. OK, that's really great, guys. We've got a couple more questions on this, but we're, we're going to hold them open so we can move on to the next question. If we get a bit of time at the end, we, we, we might come back to them. Thanks for Nigel and Lolita for your questions. We'll, we'll, we'll maybe get back to them if we can. Data driven decision making. We, we hear a lot. It's a bit of a buzzword. Yeah. Data driven decision making rolls off the tongue nicely. W what does it mean to you? How important is it? Is it a blip? Is it something that's going to change our lives? And, and again, a bit like security, where are we in the maturity stakes as organizations with this? How far into it are we? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I think you can take that statement and apply it to pretty much every, every industry, every role. Um, and, and, and I think everybody's in the same place of you want to you want to make more data driven decisions because you feel like you're making a better decision. The fact is that's only really based on the quality of the data that you're using. So, so you know, I, I've sort of got a simple approach to this, which is um, that uh, you know, if you look at it, really, when you look at data, you look, you're, you're concerned about completeness, quality, and it's only when you've got those two things you can make insights. So, so actually, it's in, in some instances, it's worse making. You know, it's a worse place to be making poor this. You know, decisions on poor data because you think you've got good data to make it on the, the not so so I mean we're very focused on that at the moment because if, if any anybody's been through any sort of digital transformation it's almost impossible to do that without first addressing what your data looks like um, and and you know we're looking at a very much a data driven transformation for for the insurance market because the quality of data that at the moment flows through the market is pretty poor um, and that's really because in, in a, in a non-digital environment, a lot of those gaps are fixed as it goes through the journey. So, you know, we do a lot of data um, validation. We do a lot of data uh, verification as, the, as it goes through the journey. If you truly want to digitalize um, any, any process um, or any customer journey, you need to ensure that actually you've got you, you know, a, a solid understanding of what's your minimum data records that you're going to need to, to ensure that that flow runs smoothly. So I, I think you know, decision making for me comes at the end of a chain around that. The, and I think most organizations, if you get to the fact where you could actually make really insightful decisions based on good data, it's a great place to be. I think for many organizations and for many industries, the challenge is actually getting that quality of data to get there. And a very similar um, example in the, um, in, the in, in the water industry. Um, when I was uh, running Mosul and, and we were, you know, our challenge there was really, believe it or not, is that you know, most people don't know where the water meter is because it's not one of those that's regularly used. So we were looking at, you know, how do you get water re re meter readings to look at how you can save water if you can't even find the meter. So yes, you can make decisions off the back of volumes, but actually you found out most of those volumes were estimated because nobody could actually get the core data. I think if you're starting from a, a position where you've, you've got, Good workflow uh, where you've got good capture up front where you can capture customer data and you can get that analytics you know you, you can get make good decisions but i don't think it's just about decision making i think it's the journey to get to the decision some people are in a better place than others um but i think a lot of us are still back in the place of certainly we are um is looking at our completeness of the data then we can move on to the quality then we can get to that decision making and analytics okay that's 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 uh, insightful i think um, one of our audiences picked up on this and said, it's when leaders abdicate responsibility and look for data to make decisions rather than using data to inform decision making. It's a subtle difference, but has a potentially big impact. That's from Harvey. Thanks for that, Harvey. Um, I, I mean, I think that that's probably some of what you were trying to say there, Des, about the, about the journey. Neve, the NHS, um, I know that in your particular area, you're not necessarily frontline, but there's a lot of data that is being thrown about in the press and the media about 
about uh, the NHS and various things, your, your world must contain a lot of data points and also a lot of decisions that need to be made. How, how are you pulling those two together in that world? Um, it's actually really hard to get all the data that you need to make that right decision making that Des was talking about, right? So it's about pulling the right data together. Um, and the reason is, is because actually the data often resides in multiple different parts of the system. And there is actually, you know, there's no neat one single central repository. I think what we're seeing now is um, an increased ability of parts of the NHS to kind of deal with some of the sharing of records. So things like, um, you know, uh, patient records, you, you, you can download an app now, and in fact, see, see some of the records. Um, but also where you actually don't need as much data as you thought in order to drive some of that decision making. And so that's something that, that, that you know, we've been grappling with. Um, the data that we deal with in resolution is highly sensitive um, and actually because there's not millions of records that are identical, it can be quite easily, you know, reverse engineered and stuff like that. So you have to be quite sensitive. So to what extent can we do some analysis, help drive out some of those learnings and then just kind of push the, the outcome out to trusts and help them learn without actually having to give them all the data, which goes contrary to some of the thinking in this data decision driven making where you try and push the data out and let people kind of, you know, use it to drive their own decisions. But actually, I think it's back to that balance about where you need to kind of hold that data securely. But it is it is a challenge for the NHS, um, you know, that, that I, and I don't think there is an easy answer to, to uh, how to knit data and, and really have it drive, particularly things like population population health, um, you know, there's lots of initiatives going on to try and address that, but it, it is a challenge. Great. Thank you. Um, Phil, what about in your world? Slightly different from the NHS. You got a view on this? Uh, yeah, I mean, it kind of overlays with the first question around information security, because having all of this data and getting closer to consumer insight, it's all very well, but you, you can't then give it to everybody. You've got to think about how you secure it or obfuscate it or democratize it. And, and I think that lends back to the commentary around um, making a decision versus informing a decision, because the moment you start obfuscating it and making it trending data, then you're informing a decision. And you've got to get that to the right people in the organization at the right time with the right veracity and the right volume then it's you've got you've got to think about how you construct that for your organization because if you can't do that and you can't trust it then the, i think the, the chain that des was talking about the moment you break that train chain from master data through the crud matrix to, to the to the inform and insight decision maker you, you, you've wasted, you're starting to waste your money because you lose the trust in the data, then you stop making the decisions you were trying to inform in the first place. And I guess you've got a bit of data overload at that point as well, and, and everybody's trying to make decisions based on different levels of trust in the data, and you don't know where you are, right? And, and the complexity of that data is is going up and up and up with every new uh, digital channel that's being opened with, you know, whether that's patient records, whether that's e-commerce orders, whether that's mobile payments with every new channel, that complexity and those routes get more complicated. And I'm certainly seeing that in, in organizations I've worked with in my current organization. We're sort of having the second go at data as it comes around. We, we, we got the message, grab all the data, capture everything you can. Now we're trying to work out how best to make sure it's reliable at the right point for the right decision at the, you know, at the right time. So Jacob, what's your experience there? Well, and yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with what's been said. I think data is important for decision making, not internally. It's if I if I consider insurance, you look at the value chain. Data is important in the lead generation and broker profiling, in in uh, informing underwriting and pricing. It's used in claims, looking at fraud. Um, so all of that is really really important. And most insurance companies have got tons of data. It's the question about how to get to it because you've got the drag of legacy. The data sits in multiple systems uh, and not in a necessarily in, in, in one format and without necessarily having the, uh, the golden record, if you like, where you can rely on the data. As, as Des said, you know, you have the quality, the completeness, and have you got the appropriate governance processes in place? 
Um, so, so the, the kind of the, the thing, uh, in my view, that is really important to do is to focus on the foundation or the foundational capabilities within an organization, to make sure you've got all the data management uh, processes and capabilities in place so that then you can start building the appropriate data quality, data governance processes around that, and then to have the data that you can rely on for making decisions or informing your uh, um, um, external processes, but but another another angle on the use of data is is also to do with the uh, improving the customer journeys. So an example of that when you apply for uh, insurance, you know, uh, and this is getting better all the time, by the way. But you, you don't have to you know fill in a multitude of forms just to provide that data. Now what you've got is the ability to enrich that data from uh, open data sources so that you can make the journey much more uh, smoother, if you like, for, for, for the customers. And, and as a result of that, you get the data that you need from open sources that are reliable uh, and then short, shortcut that process. So you're doing validation as you're actually entering the data in a, in a uh, uh, quoted by kind of uh, process. Um, and I think there is an element around, so from what I've seen, a lot of organizations to get that right, they uh, are thinking about data, their data strategies, and they're thinking about um, a, a modern architecture, if you like, that will enable them to get rid of the legacy and, and be able then to maximize the exportation of that data. A lot of them are moving to the cloud, and that's a common theme that I have seen, where you're looking at data warehouses which can be used equally for analytics as well as BI and, and MI reporting for the organization. Uh, and it enables uh, the uh, data scientists uh, as well as the people looking at you know, turning the handle in terms of producing reliable performance reporting for the company to be able to uh, externalize that data. I mean, one of the things there that, that clearly comes across, you articulated it well, I thought, Jacob, but it is, it is a very complicated world and there are high expectations around people going, well, we're a data driven company. Yeah? And, it, and it's very easy to say. And, you know, you, you said it, Jacob, you've got you've got uh, business intelligence in there. You've got data science, you've got data engineering and you need to bring all of that together. And then, uh, as Des was saying, you need to take it through the, the, the right process, the right flows. I really like Phil's point about the trust of the data. At which point does its, does its credence dip off? You know, so I, I, th I think that's really important. I think probably a, a lot of our audience are probably, you know, going through similar similar experiences and, and learning how to get the best of their data. So hopefully some of that was, was really useful for them. Um, we haven't got any specific questions about that, so uh, I'm going to move on if that's OK. It'll be interesting to see what the other panelists uh, have to say on this. The thing I'm finding hardest is, is I suppose, there are two things. One is being a leader remotely. So I can't gather people into a room. I can't even, I've not, not even met my direct reports face to face yet. And so actually doing some of those things that you would normally do in terms of leadership become a little harder. I've, I, I do now a Friday thoughts thing where I just pop some, you know, personal notes and things I've done the week to try and kind of connect to people, but it is a little harder. I think the other thing that I'm finding more challenging, particularly given the role is a brand new one, I'm here to, I have to create a brand new IT strategy and vision. Um, I've got no one to whiteboard with. I've got no one to kind of bounce the ideas off. Um, and so I am honestly finding it a little harder. And that is partly down to my personal style. I like to bounce things around, you know, groups of people and talk with people rather than go away and lock myself in a room and t think deeply about stuff. Um, and it is it is harder. And so I'm having to find sort of more creative ways of doing some of those things, um, you know, sketching up some stuff on a, you know, fairly hokey tablet, uh, you know, and then sharing it with my team to talk to them. So you have to be a bit more creative. I would say it is genuinely a bit harder. And so give yourself more time. OK, cool. So um, any of our any of our other panelists got, got any tips for, for Neve there on uh, leadership engagement in in a, in a remote environment yeah if, if I, I mean i i was just listening intently to what you uh, were saying Neem, and, I, and i i can um uh, it resonated with me and my experience certainly of, of my onboarding to the department for transport and doing interviewing on um uh, online as it were but uh, the, the only thing i was going to say is i, I recognize some of the challenges 
um, it's a lot easier for established teams to just carry on uh, in a remote environment because they know each other and they, you know, they work together for a long time. So that's a lot easier. But when establishing new teams, um, um, when I'm working with a, uh, a company at the moment, helping them with that particular question, is about uh, having the time to sit down and, and, and agree a strategy for how to do that be able to look at how the organization works, the culture within the organization, what works for the individuals. And I'm a bit like you, Nima, I like white whiteboard and I like to have kind of that face-to-face -face interaction, but in the absence of that, what um, potentially technology tools you can use, what, um, you know, um, um, on that face-to-face -face interactions online, as it were, that you can adopt, but in a, in a structured way where people can understand what would work for them individually, and be able to do that when, on a one-to-one -one basis as well as within groups. Uh, and, and that seems to work reasonably well. And that's, that's, uh, that's some great advice in there. Um, Phil, I'm, I'm going to come to you f to ask more about the sort of onboarding new people. So not your how you engage as a leader, but how you on, onboard new people. But before I do, I just counsel you to make sure that with your um, with your onboarding policies in, in lockdown is that you make sure that you agree them across all of your hiring managers. I recently had a situation where one of my uh, direct reports hired uh, person A into their team and another hired person B into their team. And one of those managers sent an introductory bottle of wine and the other one sent an introductory case of wine. And that that in itself caused pandemonium because it was complete inequality across wine distribution. So whatever your choice of onboarding your uh, staff during lockdown is, that's my top tip is to is to get it right in terms of the ratios of wine being sent out. Uh, Phil, more, more practically, what are the things that your organization has done uh, to onboard people during lockdown? Yes, I think just make it personal. I think there's there's a lot of good advice. Um, you've just covered some of that with things like care packages and, and make them feel part of the brand and the organization they're coming to. I think IT have been doing this for a while in terms of onboarding offshore organizations to work with and bringing that through in terms of this is who we are, this is what we do, this is how we work. You know, put a, put a team meeting in. I mean, I literally every week now I have a, a, you know, a team meeting so that if anything, you uptick the engagement, you uptick the, the, the FaceTime with, with people just to try and maintain that engagement and, and accept the fact that everybody is different. Some people want to turn on the video, some people will have a background, some people won't want any of that, they'll just turn up on the, on the speaker. It just is, it's down to the individual. Um, We've used, we found tools. Uh, there's one, I'm sure there's others out there. I personally have used Miro, M-I-R-O, online whiteboarding and group collaboration. That's worked really well. So I think coming back to Neve's point about being innovative, trying new things, not being afraid to say, look, we'll try this tool. If it works, great. If it doesn't, we'll try something else. You've got to keep try that, that evolution. Um, Okay. I, I, I use Myra as well. I think I think that's a that's a really great example. There's a few out there, but Myra yes. Myra seems to have got its interface well. Um, what what about from our audience? We haven't had any any questions on this. I mean, maybe not questions, but anybody got any opinions in the audience on sort of tools or techniques to 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 use? It it would be really great if each of us could go away from this and try something new with our teams over the next few days based on suggestions from the audience. So. Why don't you, uh, I'm now going to be inundated with suggestions you watch, but uh, why, why don't you give us a few few of the more innovative ones. Um, I myself have tried a few different things. I have a, a regular touch in, uh, uh, not not every morning. We, we did it every morning and found we were, we were sort of staring each other in the eyeballs. But with my team, I, I have a sort of uh, every other morning, we have a 15 minute touch in and, and we just ask how everybody is. And we ask about how the teams and stuff like that. We don't talk about the projects. We don't talk about the work. We just we just sort of have a, a water cooler moment, you know, that 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 sort of thing. And I, I think you, whoever tries to whoever solves the water cooler, inspirational, just accidental engagement from a remote thing, I think um, I think that'll be really, really useful. Uh, Steve says, Myro's good, Jamboard. Google Jamboard works well too. Uh, I think they've got a good mobile app as well on Jamboard. Uh, Lolita, agree on the emphasis, of, emphasis on the uptick or over communicating, collaborating once a team policy of work from home has been set. 
She likes Mural is another very well designed tool for team based settings. Uh, fun Retro are great tools. Peter Curtis is saying that I find Fun Retro really supports remote retrospectives incredibly well. That's a good one. Might, might give that a look. Thank you, Peter. Um, I, I have an onboarding buddy mentor to help new starter. This is something that I think that does translate from your existing business to pick up on the point you made, Phil. We already do a lot of that. Um, and, um, you know, particularly in technology and, and it, certainly in Naked Wines, we have a buddy system where you're assigned a buddy and we try not to make it. If you're in technology, we try to make it somebody from marketing. If you're in marketing, we try to make it somebody from finance, you know, to really mix it up. Um, and so you can get all the gossip on your team as well. And so and that transfers and we, we've upped that and changed it to a remote buddy system. And that works pretty well. Phil. So recent shifts in customer engagement. Um, is this something that we should be looking to do? You know, COVID's changed the way that customers engage, you know, in, in, in your industry in particular, there's quite a, quite a lot of change there. Um, should we look at changing our existing business models? Do we need to, re or, or is it all just, it's a glitch, it'll be over soon, just stick with a plan, you know, don't, don't, no need to adapt. What, what, what should we do there? Oh, look, I'm not, I'm not a medical expert, right? But yeah. I do not have Trump's confidence in the uh, arrival of a vaccine in the next couple of weeks, as was announced last night. Uh, this this appears to be uh, going to be around for a while. And, and from what I understand in terms of the pipeline of SARS and MERS, these coronaviruses that hop, uh, you know, the frequency potentially, this is, this is a, a, a thing that's around for a while to come. That aside, you know, we've had some of these tools for a very long time, you know, we've just never used them. And I think we're just now figuring out how to work in a, in a new world. Um, for me, customer engagement is absolutely key. Nobody knows what it's going to look like next year because the things that we might have thought about from a, you know, fingerprint recognition for access, well, that's probably blown out of the water in a zero touch um, pandemic world so, so rethinking some of the plans that we had and adapting to whatever local lockdown national lockdown new new rules new regs new consumer behavior i think is going to be incumbent on our technology estates and it's going to be dependent upon industries you know um that that contactless ordering was already coming through in a lot of market high street places the deliveries uber eats click and collect was, were already in place now the the acceleration of those across any brand is is you know more far more significant i think if you're in an industry where you know step one is is register the consumer step two is send them lots of paper to sign that process fundamentally has to shift pretty quickly or the regulations have to shift to allow the industry to survive in a, in a, in a remote working future way of, of, of consumer engagement. And that's just about us as IT leaders, technology leaders, business leaders adapting. And it is going to be that adapt, change, adapt, change pipeline of, 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 of uh, the future, I think. So your point is almost it doesn't matter whether COVID's a blip or not. Our, our BAU is that we've got to adapt and change because if it's not COVID, it'll be something else. And we just got to keep reiterating and iterating around, right? The longer we're here, the more the more habits people are going to have that are going to be sticky habits, right? My children don't talk about going to class anymore. They talk about going to pods and bubbles. <laughs> the... the just that as a fundamental change, you know, how many people have forgotten a mask as they walked to the shop and gone back to their car to the, we have to change, we have to adapt. I, I think that's just the, the way of the future for me. Okay, Des, you're in a very old industry, right? One, one of the older ones, a lot of tradition there. Does this apply to you? Do you guys just stick to your guns and carry on as you always have done? Or are you with Phil? Are you, have you got to, is change got to be at the core of your day to day? Um, uh, I think what we're all going to learn from this year is there's no going back from a number of things that, that, that have, have been forced upon us. And many of them, I think, have just fast track things that were happening. So if you look at trends of, you know, look at the high street as an example of, of trends of, 
you, uh, you, many of us have seen many of the sort of old retailers have struggled to adapt. Um, and you know, I think that's if you look at since since lockdown, the number of restaurant chains that have also now failed because they're all highly leveraged. And you know, anywhere that l looks at high volume, um, you know, low margin, high volume, high street business is 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 struggling. It's going to struggle because it hasn't got the throughput that it needed. Um, I, you, you know, so I think many of the changes that we've seen uh, are going to stay with us. The the over 50s moving online for shopping um, is a bit is another big one. You know, so, so you're going to you know, that was a group that if you went to the high street or if you went to a supermarket, you know, that that um, demographic was was what was your, your core audience that was not going online or was, or was slower to get online. They've been forced online. And that's not going to change. So anybody who's not looking and saying next year is completely different to the year, last year, um, you know, I don't think any business is, is 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 looking to say we'll just carry on and do what we're doing. For us, you know, we were already starting um, a digital transformation to try and move effectively a, a, a paper-based old market, you know, old style market, to a digital market. Um, and what we've seen is actually this has been an accelerator for us because it's been, we've been forced to move to things like electronic placement um, and more work being done. And I've, I've, there was <laughs> you said too much uh, industry talk, but, but pre-bind, which is effectively before you, the pre, before you moment, your risk has been underwritten effectively and contractually, contractually underwritten. A lot of that has had to move online. And they were, you know, they were areas where you had a lot of entrenched views about well, no, I go to and meet my you know my underwriter. I go and see them, and I know, I know I get a good deal from the look in their eyes. Very similar to I, I worked in investment banking through periods when we did when we transformed the the uh, you know th those markets, and you know you'd always get a trader say I have to look in the eye to see I've got a good deal, right? and I think that sort of you know that sort of thing is, is is moving away. For us, it was very much an accelerator. We've seen an increase in electronic placement. We opened up a virtual room for, if, you, if anybody sort of understands the Lloyds building, the first floor, four, four floors are actually what we call underwriting rooms. They're sort of trading rooms where people, brokers come to underwrite their risk. But about 40,000 people can come into those rooms and do that business. We've virtualized that so that they've got directory that they can, you know, we're trying to find why do you come to the room? You've got plate electronic placement. Why do you come to the room and how do we start to replicate that in a, in a virtual world? That won't go away either. There'll be parts of our business that will actually find that much easier. If I'm a broker coming in and I can access, you know, a, 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 a number of um, managing agents more quickly, or from a managing agent, I can actually manage my queue um, of brokers that want to see me more effectively because I can do that online and virtually. I think we're just going to see that that's the way of working going forward. So I think there'll be some things that will drop back, but I think fundamentally there's a lot of good um, change that's been driven through this, that's been forced upon us. And I think for a lot of it, there's no going back. And we just need to accept that. Okay. Thanks Des. So uh, Nigel L, one of our uh, audiences said, our panelists finding that there is an upside to the pandemic which is that consumers are now much more accepting to change, which, which I think is the, the, the point that you're making, Des, it's been forced upon us. And therefore there's a real opportunity, opportunity to introduce change at a faster rate and in a more profound way. Neve, not so much consumers, but you have lots of, of stakeholders that you work with, lots of internal customers. And again, you know, in, in the NHS, which I'm sure has its fast moving parts, but I'm sure has its very stuck in its ways traditional parts as well. You know, have, have we have we proved to ourselves that we can move faster, do more, and, and and how do we gain? You know, how do we keep the momentum of that in a post-COVID world? I think that's absolutely critical. I mean, spot on, really, for, from Nigel there. But but it, it is it is both you know patients, consumers, users, and clinicians. I, I spent four years. Uh, looking after the health sector, uh, health practice in Accenture, trying to persuade, you know, vir virtual consultations were happening, we need to do this, we need to do this, and suddenly overnight, everyone moves to virtual consultations. And all, we had to brush away all the objections because there was no other choice. So, it, it, but it showed, I think, everyone that you can affect great change and do it very rapidly. 
and it's bumpy and it's never perfect and there are people for whom it doesn't work but it shows you that there is so much that's possible to do very rapidly and perhaps we're guilty sometimes of holding ourselves back um, and saying oh well maybe that's not going to work maybe users won't like it maybe people won't like it and actually sometimes you've just got to press the go button i mean i'm having a slightly serial conversation internally at the moment where where we're, we're piloting some features of teams and i'm like just switch it all on just switch it all on and let anything you know and let's see what happens right and people will work out how to use it and people will will find their own ways and then we can come back and give guidance but there's no there's nothing to pilot here um so it's it okay. is so, I, think, I think we can do a lot more faster all right and i, and I think we we'd all resonate with that a little bit there's an opportunity that has been shown to us up and down the organization i think a lot of the more senior people not just technologists phil said earlier technology is kind of used to working remotely but i think there are other departments who may be a little bit more we need to get to the office who, who have, who've learned that um lolita asked a, a, an interesting question in, in this regard to employees and, and people working COVID has brought about new unanticipated ways of working within the remote space which i believe we might now consider as part of our long-term work policy package so what do we think about that? If we're changing the way people are working, you know, and, and it's been forced, as Des was saying, and, and we're now doing that, how should we be looking at people's packages, their compensation, how we support them in those remote working ways? How, how does that how does that factor in? Anybody got any thoughts on that? I mean, I, I, I can talk a little, a little bit of that. I mean, I think it's, been, it's interesting just talking to a few colleagues. Um, I, I think our challenge at the start when we went into this and, and, and people are coaches have it. So when we first went into lockdown, people were, how do I, you know, how can I work in lockdown? How do I do this? How do I remotely work? We've been doing this for six months now, roughly. And now people like uh, are back to, how do I not do this? How do I go back to work? How do I travel? How do I you know, do those things? With, with, you know, with experience, and I know we're not alone, um, People ask it to be paid to come into the office because people that are not in the office don't have to pay for their transport and travel and lunches. Um, and it, it's a, it's a, for me, it's a strange mindset that says, yeah, but you've been paid for that and you've got the benefit for the last six months. And I think it's a case of careful what you wish for, because I think, you know, it, it, if, if, if actually from an, from an organizational point of view, you know, on a personal level, I, you know, I would definitely question the fact that I, you know, my, somebody's compensation of, takes into account things like traveling to London. We used to have London waiting, for instance, in London. Like that went away and it got baked into people's, um, in, in people's salaries. But that was a payment because of the cost of coming to London, the cost of London lunches were all higher. Well, if that goes away, why, why, why would I be looking to pay somebody more for working in London when I can pay them the same to, to go out? I think we're going to see a, a quite a fundamental shift in displacement of, of staff. I think more organisations are going to be open to remote working. More people are going to be open to remote working. You're going to have to look at um, really you know, on the real estate side um, where house prices in London are dropping and house prices on the outskirts of London and, and I think Devon, Cornwall and Dorset have seen the biggest rises because people are starting to say I don't need to, to know, I no longer need to live in the centre of London if I'm going to work three days a week outside of it. So I think we're definitely going to start to see the work population change. I, I don't know what that, I, I can't say I know what that's going to look like. I don't know if we'll continue to find that you know, young people particularly come to London for London. You know, we, we happen to then use London because we get resource pools. And I think that's the other part is where skills are going to lie. And we still get hot, hot spots of skills and, and, and why, you know, why the roles still sit in London? Well, because there's certain skills that, that obviously are gravitated to London. So I, I think it's going to be an, an interesting period over the next year, 18 months. I do think we're going to see change. I, I, yeah, I'm not sure I've got the, the right crystal ball to work out exactly what it's going to look like. But I think people need to, that flexibility needs to be on both sides, both with individuals and with companies. Well, um, I think you've already answered uh, Hamid's question, which was, uh, you know, if we're, if we're going to be in this world, then, uh, and working from home is the norm, where should we look for our talent, right? And I, and I think you just sort of said, you know, well, we need to consider that, we need to think about it. I think that'll be an evolving question. But certainly, you know, for myself, 
uh, uh, the headquarters of Naked Wines has always been in, in Norwich, up in Norfolk. And, and that in itself, that's where it grew out of and that's where it was founded. It's always been very um, almost belligerently there, you know, and saying this is where we are. And just in the last month, we've we've recruited two completely remote um, employees in the technical discipline. Um, and, and, you know, everybody's going, oh, didn't, didn't know we could do that, you know, and so I think that's, you know, really opening up that pool. But to your point about you haven't got your crystal ball, I, th I think Steve in our audience thinks he might have. So he says, could it be more likely we'll no longer have team building and planning away days, but more in the office days? Are we seeing a whole reversal of this? And suddenly it's going to be like, right, everybody in the office and, and that's it. Phil, you're nodding. Is, is that how you see it rolling? Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot more work from home and a lot more you know, one day or two days a week in the office, um, you know, social distancing aside, it, it's finding that space to come together as a team. But it, it, it's, I think, fundamentally, we're going to see a shift. And if it's not a shift in terms of, you know, corporate office costs, it's a shift in terms of lifestyle choices for people, efficiency, you know, several hours of commuting on trains or motorways is that an effective use of time when you've got an agenda that says you could do most of that um you know you, you've proven how effective the team or that the process can be working remotely i think for me um from a technology point of view where does the corporate boundary stop in a world where it's no longer bring your own device because nobody's bringing anything they're staying put Right. So if they're staying put on their home network or that, you know, how many people on this call as technology leaders have had a call about the corporate technology being poor. And it's really slow today. And it's well, that's because you've got teenagers at home streaming Xbox games or whatever. It, it, you know, where does it stop now? Well, our boundaries will fundamentally shift from a technology point of view over the coming months and years, I think as these new ways of working are, are adopted and, and and we change we change how we go about our business and i don't i don't think it's just the technology phil i think i think you're right that will change but uh, abid's uh, stuck in a question here is working from home sustainable for younger staff in shared accommodation and has productivity suffered in your teams yeah and, and i think we're going to see not just technology change but i can almost see over time the housing market changing suddenly if you've got a garage that can be converted to an office your property is going to be more valuable right i you know i can almost see that thing you, you, you des and and, and neve and phil are uh, coyly hiding behind a nice screen but i've seen behind there they're all sitting in plush offices at home guys right um, i'm sure some of our some of our audience are as well but we have to be cognizant there will be a lot of people you know uh, generally younger than us earlier in their careers than us who are maybe in shared accommodation balancing laptops at the uh, you know on the seti and stuff like that we've got to think about those they're, they're the lifeblood of our organization coming through jacob how, how are we going to deal yeah. with it those people how would no, that help? I, I, I agree and I don't think the model is going to be the same for everybody um, uh, for the individual as you've just described I think there will be people who would prefer to come back to an office but ultimately the question is around what does the company need from the individuals and therefore what you've got to do is segment your population just to understand who needs to be in the office and what, whether on a full-time basis or not and for those people who have, will have more flexibilities. So, so I, I, see, I don't see it as one size fits all. I see an element of segmenting the, 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 the you know, population within an organization to decide on the best model that needs to be adopted for the future. Um, and I do, I do see um, a, a scenario where people will stop traveling to get to the office to sit at a desk. And, and do their work from a desk. I think it becomes much more about the whiteboarding question. You know, I'll go to the office because I need to meet with some people and we'll have a, a whiteboarding exercise. So I think in the, the, re the redesign of the office, if you like, of the new normal, it's gonna be more around less desks, more meeting spaces, um, um, more meeting rooms, and the ability for people to come in to be able to uh, co-create and to be working working together. If I've got something to do, I will probably be more productive doing it from from home. In my case, in some some other people's cases, it might not be the most optimal thing for them. So, so I think we're going to see a, a combination of these things emerge, uh, depending on the company's needs uh, as well as the individuals. Um, I don't necessarily see a world where it's all going to be one thing or another, if that makes sense. 
it, it makes perfect sense. And, and, and Des, I know you want to talk about a point which which I've also sort of thought of as, as I walk down our, our town's high street and see lots of these empty department stores and, and shops that are no longer there as the high street, traditional high street stroke slowly dies. I can't help thinking about work hubs. T tell us about your conversation about work hubs you, you've had recently, Des. Yeah, we, 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 were, we, were, we were talking about how, you know, what, what is it that people need to come into the work, into the office for? And we, we were finding, to, to answer a question earlier about, yeah, a, a lot of our, our younger staff were, were struggling because of, the, because of the type of accommodation that they're working in. And we got into a conversation about the um, about, you know, possibility of, you know, could we set up local work hubs around London? I.e., are there sort of places around London that we could actually set up our own sort of um, remote space? Not in a WeWorks type style. Um, and I think, you know, um, I think if you've been in the centre of London, we, WeWorks or, or that sort of industry, I think, would, is probably going to struggle an, an awful lot because it's based on the premise of coming into town. But, but something similar in, in, a, in a concept of, you know, and, and maybe this is something where the coffee shops start to see more business and, you know, the, you know Costas or whoever around, you know, I need to get out my flat or I need to get out of my room or my, and I want to go somewhere to base myself for the day, maybe for one day or maybe for, for more, but it needs to be local. I need to walk to it. I don't want to travel. And I need a, I need a, a sort of small business, you know, like function, you know, and I think that there's certainly something in it for the, for, for us in that we, you know, we've been looking at, how, could we potentially create sort of you know, work hubs, would they be shared? Could we create what sort of ones for for our um, employees? Um, particularly, as I said, for for those that haven't got um, a home setup that works, where they can sit at home and work easily, either through you know childcare or, or or situations. You know, we've got quite a few of our, uh, our younger staff still live at home because of the cost of London, um, and they're they're working and living out of a bedroom all day, and and you know they want to get out and 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 socialise. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so, so, so that's certainly something that we've been investigating. And I think maybe, you know, somebody sort of talked about what opportunities might pop out of, out of this. That might be an opportunity there. Yeah. And then I think to your point, you know, we, we, we might see a change in High Street because we might see more of those popping up. Yeah. And uh, Harvey said Whitbread used to have some work hub spaces alongside some of their travel ins years ago. They were good, usually just off motorways. So easy to get to. Thanks for that, Harvey. Um, yeah, David, I think I think Barclays were looking at using their high street chain of, of banks as, as those kind of hubs. I think each individual organisation has those opportunities if they have high street estates to create some of those things. I think it's not just the, the, the drop in hubs. I think organisations will probably look at how they create their own hubs. And I think it's about that choice and flexibility. Are you offering us all a little bit of space in the corner of a Costa there, Phil? Is that what you're offering up there? No? If, if you guys want to come into a Costa and buy some awesome coffee, you are more than welcome. Okay, that's a good business model. I like it. I like it. We, we're going we're gonna, to uh, wrap up now, guys, because um, we, we've come to the end of our time. There's a lot of interest around this question. So um, I'd just, just like to go you know, once more around the, uh, around the table, if I can, particularly interested in you know, since your organizations have been working from home more, I'm sure you've all been actively trying to support remote joiners, people working from home who don't have perfect setup and facilities. What would you say the impact has been on productivity? Because that's the question uh, one of the attendees has asked about um, productivity. I, I, for my organization, know I'll, I'll kickstart this. We've had 50% less illness in the last six months. Uh, and I, I don't think that's because people have necessarily been less ill. I think it's because it's not been something that, you know, where they've said, well, I can't come into the office because I don't want to spread my cold around or actually, um, you know, I've got a bit of deli belly or whatever, but then it clears up by mid morning and, you know, they, they crack on. So I think we've just had lots of less registered illness and people have been able to work more flexibly from home. We've also embraced people not quite working a nine to five, which given we're a global organization, that's really helped with the early hours for Australia. And then the later hours for America for us. So that's worked well. Overall, I would say in productivity terms, we've not seen a downtick. And in certain areas for certain pieces of work, we've seen an uptick. Neve, what, what's it like in your organization? 
Yeah, I would say very similar, very similar trends, particularly around things like uh, sickness and, 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 and that sort of thing. Um, I think, uh, you know, it does vary, as you say, by area. I, I think there was a question around demographic as well. I think, you know, we do have a, a strong cohort of people who are finding working from home difficult and challenging and I think you know there, there are there is the people who are the, the younger people who uh, perhaps have got you know you know not amazing setups we've got people who've got small children and it is challenging to have you know children in the room screaming around you know if you're trying to if you're trying to do uh, you know difficult concentrated work um, but also interestingly some of the people that the empty nesters who are finding it very lonely actually uh, to be on their own all day uh, and there's no one to talk to and no one to sit and have lunch with or have a coffee with or whatever so so th there is a mental health um challenge i think around how we keep people motivated and engaged and i think it's quite easy to fall into the trap of assuming that everyone's at home with a very traditional setup you know at home with a with a spouse or partner and kids or you know who, who don't require too much attention and 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 you've got space and, and and convenience of an office and somewhere to work that's really not the case for, for many people so i think we haven't seen it hit yet but we're seeing it in the survey results people starting to say i'm not sure if i want to continue exactly like this so this flexible mode i think will be key going forward this part work part going Going in part of staying at home okay phil what have you seen in your organization yeah look i think i think it's i think it's um mental and physical well-being i mean i used to walk quite a lot across a car park and, and now you find you're not walking between meetings anymore and it is just those little things you know and yeah i have the luxury of of personal space to to work and i think if you don't have that if you have younger children it can be really challenging to balance i think from my point of view um you know making sure the team feel that flexibility that if they can't start at nine o'clock because they have childcare or, or you know um somebody else needs to use their network then fine have the meeting at 10 o'clock you know if people need to finish their working day at four or five then so be it it's not it is it is i think about creating a uh, a, a collaborative culture where you're not afraid to have a dog barking because you're actually at home and you are working and it's just somebody's come to the door at a really inconvenient time um so, so for me i think it's just about adapting to those changes and making people feel comfortable that they can choose to decline choose to exist in their own space how they would want to without feeling comfortable in it yeah and no, i think that's good and i think it, it, it's great to hear this kind of thing from us as leaders because that's where that's where the bar needs to be set not just in giving people license to the showing a bit of leadership in our behavior as well jacob are you uh, are, you, are you adopting yourself to uh, to a better productivity from home and and, and you know is, are you seeing that in the organizations you've worked in during lockdown um uh, yes i mean i think i think the uh, the main thing is, I think people are working longer hours, and I think the important thing is to get to some sort of a some discipline around taking breaks and just not walking, not walking between meetings and between meeting rooms and floors and what have you. You're actually, you know, assigning yourself time to go for a walk around the around the park or, or what have you. But but one of the things which I uh, think has been um, not necessarily a surprise, but uh, a pleasant surprise if you like is the fact when you talk about agile teams agile teams thrive on co-location right they want to be together they want to work in the same room you have the daily stand-ups the daily prayers and all the rest of it and one of the things which uh, has uh, proved to be uh, um, interesting is during the lockdown productivity has not suffered in fact i have heard many colleagues and and uh, people i know who have reported an increase in productivity for, for agile teams, especially those established agile teams. I think if you're going to start this now, it will probably take some time to get up to speed and to become uh, more productive. But, but if you've got an established team working in an agile way, uh, one, one of the good things that has come out from the lockdown is the fact that productivity has not suffered. In fact, in some cases, it has improved dramatically. 
Yeah, well, I think that's absolutely true, and and it, and is a great advocacy for for more agile working, right? I think I think that's that's the way. It's slight slight change. Ceremonies are a little bit different, but absolutely the same principles uh, principles align. Des, final word from you on this: How's your organisation faring productivity wise? All going great, or is everybody going down the pub? Um, <laughs> I'd love I'd love it if we were able to go down the pub, but uh, but no. Um, I, I, I mean, I think very much uh, echo what Neve said was, uh, you know, I, I think we've been we've been OK from a productivity point of view. Um, I think the challenge we've got is that people are working like they did in the office at home. So to Jacob's point of view um, as well around, we, I don't think people have adapted. They're doing what they used to do. So meetings are the same style of meeting. Um, everything's very deliberate interaction. Um, you know, if you want to speak to somebody, you've got to make a meeting for them. You've got to sit in front of a video and talk to them. Um, and I think that is starting to wear people. Um, so so our, I think our challenge is going to be sustainability of that. It's about how, you know, we, we, how do we stop, as this goes on further, how do we stop the erosion of culture, and, and, and for, particularly for new people coming in? How do we stop the erosion of the network? Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, we are, we, the things we are delivering at the moment were generally set up or running prior to lockdown. People knew who to go to. Those teams were sort of set. I think the challenge will come more as we try to sort of keep that network going. And, and new, particularly with new people flowing through, um, if you're not in the office and you haven't got that go-to person, you don't have that water cooler conversation, you don't walk out of the room sort of going, I didn't quite get what they meant there. Um, you know, we all just hit buy, wave, go. And, and, you know, if you're lucky, you get an IM conversation going off to the side. But I think all of that is going to start to be something that we've got to be much more conscious of, um, particularly around, you know, the sustainability of, of this. We've lived off, you know, IT are great, you know, particularly technologists are great at responding to a crisis. Right? We, we, we firefight, we respond really well. Uh, you know, we, we, you'll see that as soon as you get an outage, you know, everybody's there. We're, we're used to working long hours. We're used to working weekends, unsociable hours, if you're involved with change or development cycles or you know, you're used to that. Um, but equally, we get the break from that of, of being in the office and bouncing off others. And I, you know, on a personal level, I, I've managed to return to the office you know, a number of times now sort of, for a couple of weeks. Um, and, and most of the people that I saw in the office had the same um, reflection, which was they hadn't realised how, how their energy levels had dropped and how their focus had gone until they came back in the office and realised the difference and how much energised they felt in the office and how their focus was much higher. I don't think anybody had noticed it until they returned. And I think that's the danger. It's that sort of like a bold frog. I think we'll just maybe just sort of see that start to sort of drop down. Um, and that's something we've got to be really conscious of. As I said, on a personal level, um, you know, for me, I need to bounce off people and getting that energy uh, from others um, and being focused where I work, you know, it, it, you, being in that mindset when, you, when you're in the office, to me works. But I think everybody's going to have to find their own new, new norm. I think that's going to be the thing. So I can't believe you ended this by saying getting new normal in there. That, that was an awful plan. <laughs> um, uh, we avoided it the whole blooming meeting and then you got it right in at the end. <laughs> I'm dropping some more, uh, some more in there. But uh, yeah. I think maybe, the maybe, we'll, maybe those days going back to the office, we'll call them recharge days so that we can all re-energize as we go into them. That, that sounds like a good plan. Listen, thank you very much, panel. You've been absolutely wonderful. Some really lively debate. We got through a number of questions. Um, from our audience and there were some great questions sorry if we didn't get to your questions uh, hopefully everybody enjoyed it um, and um, yeah I, I really enjoyed having having the conversation